This is Theatre Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. One of the best theater books of the year is about a season 406 years ago, and we are <laughs> pleased to have its author with us tonight. Here to introduce it, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. You have one of the best theater books of the year, one of the best history books of the year, A Year in the Life of William Shakespeare, 1599, by an old friend of mine, the man who uh, made me what I am today, my oh, Columbia oh, College. You can't blame me. My <laughs> oh, Columbia oh, yeah. College professor, Jim Shapiro. Welcome to Theater Talk. Uh, it's great to see you, Mike. Come and con too, Susan. congratulations on this very, very fine book. All right. One Year in the Life of William Shakespeare, 1599. Why this year? Two good reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, one is I started researching it, and it soon became too late to change the year. Uh, <laughs> you thought, uh, 1600 would have been so much you know, better. But. I thought the price and the title were going to be the same, and I couldn't persuade my publishers <laughs> of that. 1599 was a great year for Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. It was one of the most productive years. He finished Henry V, which he had been kicking around for a while. Right. He wrote Julius Caesar, and then, uh, as you like, in a quick succession. And as the year is coming to a close, he wrote what's arguably his greatest play, Hamlet. Mm -hmm. So everybody wants to understand, how did Shakespeare go from writing Merry Wives of Windsor, right. or Much Ado About Nothing, to Hamlet? And I joined the long line of critics worried about that question. But your tactic on it was to examine what is going on in Britain, in English politics, culture, and society at the time, and that these plays that Shakespeare's writing, he is responding to the political dynamic of the time. And what is happening in this year politically that changes him as a writer? Right. I wanted to find out everything I could. And there's only a limited amount of information about Shakespeare. But if you put Shakespeare in London, playing at the court, in his company, who was he working with? With whom was he collaborating? What was going on in London, in England, and abroad? I thought we might end up with a more nuanced sense of who he was and how the world around him feeds into the play. I mean, I, I'm a New Yorker. I walk down the street after 9-11, and every third person's writing a novel mm -hmm. post 9-11. And one or two of them, perhaps, are going to figure out how to write a novel that captures the moment, mm -hmm. that captures what we all live through. So. The same holds true for Shakespeare. There are 15 or 16 professional playwrights writing at the time. Mm -hmm. They're all trying to catch the spirit of the age. Shakespeare does it better than everybody else. Mm -hmm. The research here and the way it's presented so uh, grippingly and, and, and accessibly uh, really does help you understand how he's changing as a, as, 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 as a writer. Um, on a, first on the personal level, I'm very interested in um, Will Kemp, who's a clown. Uh, who's very important in, uh, in the stage at the time, and very important in Shakespeare's plays. But Shakespeare and he break away from each other. And you argue that that helped Shakespeare think of writing plays in a different way. What was Will Kemp's influence? And by breaking away from that, how did Shakespeare change? Sure. Shakespeare joined a company uh, which turned out to be the most extraordinarily talented playing company and stable playing company in uh, 1594. They call themselves the Chamberlain's Men. They were made up of busted companies that had merged and broken up and formed again. This would be the most important company for the next 20 years or 25 years of English theater. They became the King's Men after King James came to the throne. But in 1599, they were the Chamberlain's Men. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they had the best tragedian in the land, Richard Burbage. Mm -hmm. And they had the best comedian in the land, Will Kemp. And Will Kemp thought he was the man. He was the one that people came to see. Shakespeare wrote the lines, but he delivered them. He was like and, Nathan Lane. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, let's not kid ourselves. Sure, yeah. kid, you know, you're the, uh, the playwright. Right. But I'm going to change this stuff. I'm going to improvise if they're out there and they need me to. That's, mm -hmm. that's what they're paying for. And you could just see Shakespeare over time. He's written maybe 20 plays for Kemp and Burbage, and he's, and he's figured out how to promote their styles pretty well. But it's coming to a head around 1599. And we know this because one of the things that happened at the, right at the end of 1598, and my book begins with this, mm -hmm. is they lost their lease on the theater. They owned the building. They didn't have the lease. So during Christmas week of 1598, while the landlord was away for Christmas holiday, Shakespeare's company came armed and in the company of uh, carpenters and dismantled their old playhouse called the theater in the northern suburbs. And they so they could take the wooden building. Exactly. Yeah, that yeah. was, you know, <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. 700 That's pounds. Wonderful I mean, stuff. You can't, you couldn't, you couldn't get oak timbers in London at this point. You have to get <laughs> Baltic fur shipped over. Uh, so uh, they didn't have enough money to build a theater, although they had the materials. So they brought Shakespeare in, they brought Kemp in, and they said, you become partners. 
you're already partners in the acting company, you'll become part owners of the theater. Everybody who was in on this deal, five of the players, uh, in addition to Burbage, became made men. Kemp signed on, and then within a month or two, he bailed out, sold his share of the theater to the others, and like many a rock star before and since, went solo. Thought, this is going to be my great career. And it didn't work out. He died penniless three years later, as everybody who goes solo does. Now, you talk about the tradition Kemp came from of this kind of comedian that uh, uh, when people went to the theater, the comedian would do a bit before the play, do a bit after the play. Sure. Even if it was a tragic, the comedian was still right. expected to do a You know, Romeo and Juliet other. are bleeding on stage. And the audience uh, <laughs> cheers and applauds. People push in from the exits. Only at this point, they don't care about the play. They want to see the jig, this the jig, rowdy, yeah. bawdy dance, crotch-grabbing stuff. And all the dramatists clearly hated it. Even a popular dramatist like Decker hated the jig. You know, the jigs were uh, sub-literary, you know. Na, 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 that kind of stuff. You know, it just doesn't <laughs> translate as a script, and very few of them survive. Yeah. Most of them called Kemp's Jig. I mean, he was, he was the master of the jig. He was a great dancer. When he went solo, he did a, a solo dance to, to Norwich. I mean, that's what he you did. You speculate that Shakespeare just didn't want to put up with that anymore. He, that he felt he was, his, his writing was too great yeah, the to Shakespeare, be bra but, but framed by a jig. What's happening, though, is Kemp believe Shakespeare is then going to assert the power of the playwright in the field. Sure, field. and that's the classic yeah. fight. You know, who, who gets top billing? Who's, whose theater is this? Is this a playwright's theater or is it an actor's theater? Mm -hmm. Do the actors get to improvise so they get to steal the show? Yeah. Burbage was smart and he hung in there and Shakespeare wrote Hamlet for him as a reward <laughs> right. and everything else. And right. when, they, when Burbage died, they basically ran through all the great roles Shakespeare wrote for him. When Kemp died, the, uh, the entry read Kemp, a man, and that was it. I mean, yeah. it was over for him. And uh, he played some great roles. He played, so, you know, so the split from roles. Kemp allows Shakespeare to uh, assert the dramatist, push the dramatist at the center of the theater. And he has a new theater. And he has a new theater. He has a new building. It's, it's, it's a stone's throw away from their rival's company. The Admiral's been playing at the Rose. Right. So you have to assert a new identity. It can't right. be the same stuff. And so we think, we don't know exactly, but we think he opened this theater with Julius Caesar? In all likelihood, that's, you know, that's the first play uh, sometime in July that uh, opened the globe. And arguably his first great tragedy, Julius Caesar. You know, I love Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. I, I enjoy seeing Titus Andronicus, but Julius Caesar's on another level. His political, a political play. What's it's going on in the politics play. of the time now in England that Julius Caesar is a response to? Sure, and if you back up a little bit, it's easier to, to, to pinpoint it with Henry V, mm -hmm. which he had tried to finish. And at the end of the second part of Henry IV, he actually promises in an epilogue that uh, uh, Kemp's going to be back. Yeah, he's going to be fooling around with, you know, Falstaff, his great role is going to be back, and he's going to fool around with Catherine of France, and you're going to love it. It's the only time Shakespeare announces what's coming next. <laughs> right at that point, things fracture. Right. So he rewrites the epilogue to the second part of Henry IV. None of that's in there. Mm -hmm. No and Falstaff. No Falstaff, and Henry V has his hole in the middle of it. No Julius Falstaff. Caesar doesn't have a comic star either. It took them till the end of the year to get Robert Armin, the short, dry, witty guy mm -hmm. who, you know, great role would be the fool and Lear. Right. So he got some good roles out of Shakespeare right. as well. And Shakespeare finishes Henry V, and he's finishing it at a very dark moment uh, in English history. England had had uh, problems with Ireland going back decades and really centuries. And uh, in 1598, there was an Irish rebellion, an insurgency against English rule. And they overran uh, Munster and other parts of Ireland. And they threatened to just kick the English army out. They actually massacred English forces at a battle called Yellow Ford. So England had to send troops over. And they had no standing army. Mm -hmm. So they pulled 16,000 men off the street, out of taverns, maybe even out of theaters. You're conscripting them, as you point out, exactly. and very um, unfortunately. It's, you were in the wrong tavern at the, at the wrong time. You, would you were be, going to Ireland. You were going to Ireland. And it was not pretty. Yeah. These troops were under-equipped poorly armed, facing an insurgency that was very savvy, fighting on their home court. Now, I have to say, Jim, here's this book. I know you've been working on it for a number of years. But here we have this book about this army of English who go to put down an, an insurgency in, in, in a wild land where they really uh, have no business being in a certain sense. And uh, the insurgency leads to huge uh, domestic problems. Did, we, did you go, wow, this is 
This is plugging you into know, my, <laughs> here's America plugging right into my book. Right into Elizabethan I, England? I started this book when Michael was right. an undergraduate, <laughs> right. so that's my defense. <laughs> but I have to say, in the last couple of years, I started feeling this is getting a little uncomfortable because uh, I'm writing about what happened and I'm writing out of contemporary records mm -hmm. and I can't tell you what's going to happen in Iraq. I can tell you what happened What in happened 59. in the Earl of Essex. Yeah. It was a disastrous campaign yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, there's a great moment in the, uh, the course of the fifth act of Henry V mm -hmm. uh, and the course comes out and he stops for a second and says let's just set aside this fantasy of 200 years ago, we're telling the story of King Henry's great return after his victory at Agincourt. However great our ancestors in London celebrated that moment, it's going to be even greater when the Earl of Essex comes back, the general of our gracious empress, with rebellion broached on his arm from Ireland coming, is going to come back. Well, it, that's not the way it worked out. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the play was published a year later, this scene and a number of others were cut from it. Yeah. So uh, it's one of the more topical moments in Shakespeare, but it gives you a sense of the way in which Shakespeare's writing out of an historical moment. Those in the audience don't know, you know what's happening to their brothers and fathers and cousins yeah. who are going over there, or in fact whether they're going to walk out of the theater and be grabbed and packed off to Ireland. So you can imagine the uh, intensity of this. Speaking of the generous empress, uh, Queen Elizabeth I is a very important character, and in your book, and I don't feel like you like her very much. I don't think I've read such an indictment of her and, and, in a long time. And I mean, you really make me think much more negatively of her than, uh, than many of our I like her uh, because I think she practices uh, real politics. You know, <laughs> uh, maybe I've been in an English department too maybe, long, maybe, so maybe. Cause she comes yeah. off bad, but she's the most formidable figure. She's the she smartest is, yeah. person in the book. Yeah. When Essex comes back from Ireland, he bursts in on her, on the Virgin Queen. She's not up, she's not made up. She's in the late 60s. It takes her a little while to get put together. She's an actress who's caught before she has to appear on stage. Mm. She's so cool. She doesn't know whether he's coming at the head of an army, which he had been thinking about doing, to, to overthrow the government. And instead, she says, you're all muddy, clean yourself up, yeah, come yeah, back yeah. in a few minutes. She says, sends out a, you know, her servants, you know, is he alone with friends or with an army, <laughs> right. finds out what the story is, cuts him off, says, Throws him in jail, yeah. <laughs> under house arrest, he yeah. never sees her again. Yeah. Yeah. He thought he was smarter than her, he's more charismatic. Yeah. She was tough. And maybe, maybe what you were responding to was, uh, I, I love Elizabeth, but she's tough and she is inflexible. And let me tell you, she had to be. This was a man's world. Mm -hmm. And she had to outsmart everyone, and she did. Well, then to bring this back to Shakespeare's plays, though, Julius Caesar is a play about political unease at the top. And this is what you're saying with Elizabeth and es Essex. There is this threat to her that he might depose her. And in Julius Caesar, of course, Julius Caesar is deposed. Shakespeare is writing this. How then does... We don't know, I guess, if Elizabeth saw this. How does Shakespeare get away at a time of great censorship with making these stark parallels between what's happening in Julius Caesar and what's happening in her court right now? You know, it, one of the things he does is he stops writing English history right at this moment mm. because that is getting people into trouble. That's too close. A guy named Hayward's in jail and his book's burnt yeah. this spring. Okay, so I won't tell the history of Henry IV. Let's take it back to classical times. It's a funny play. You, you read Dante, as you did in Humanities in Columbia, and Dante sticks Brutus in the bowels of hell. Mm -hmm. Milton elevates Brutus as his great Republican hero. Mm -hmm. 400 years after this play is written, we still don't know whether Brutus is the hero or the villain of the play, whether the conspirators were right to do it yeah. or not. And I think that speaks to Shakespeare's genius. I don't know... His ambivalence towards Elizabeth yeah, herself? or his ability to keep his politics, mm -hmm. his own political views... Uh, to himself at the same time to write the most riveting political drama possible. Mm -hmm. I think people walked away uh, with possibly two kinds of responses to this play. One, there are legitimate reasons for deposing a bad ruler or somebody who would be tyrannical. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, the second half of the play, it's going to be chaos. Mm -hmm. It's going to be civil war. However bad strong arm rulers are, mm -hmm. the alternative is worse. And I, I really, after teaching this for 25 years, can't tell you which way I think the play breaks. Mm -hmm. And that is... And that's how Shakespeare keeps himself from <laughs> being in trouble like other players. Marlowe is assassinated, yeah. Kidd is ragged, <laughs> Johnson in prison, Shakespeare takes his money, buys a nice house in Stratford, stays out of trouble. And mm -hmm. it's not that he's propagandistic. I don't think Henry V is a pro-war or an anti-war play. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a play for nation and uh, at war.
and I think that's slightly different. We're going to have to jump over a, as you like it to get to Hamlet. But it's so. But it's just <laughs> I'm interesting. glad because I'm weaker on actually. Like it. <laughs> it's not actually one of my favorite plays. I have to be honest with you. Uh, but it's interesting though. You say that he writes Julius Caesar, guardedly, let's say. His next great tragedy. I mean, an explosion in the history of 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 of, of culture, literature. In fact, Hamlet. He's going to come up with a character who is going to do nothing but reveal himself again and again to his audience and to himself. How does you, how do you go from the guarded Shakespeare of Julius Caesar to a playwright who is now writing about a man who is nothing if not introspection all the yeah. time? You know, you see in Brutus's early soliloquies mm -hmm. the beginnings of what would really be remarkable in Hamlet. This this self-exploration, watching a character think aloud. When Harold Bloom speaks of the invention of the human. Right. I take that as meaning we finally get to watch characters uh, who are thinking and we get to watch their mind unpack itself. Right. And Hamlet is the greatest example of that. Shakespeare is reading Montaigne at this time. People are starting to write personal essays. They never existed right. before this. That's feeding this play. Yeah. What's also feeding it, I think, is the kind of anxiety that's pervasive, both about succession, who's going to follow mm -hmm. Elizabeth, even about invasion. The play begins with these, uh, this incredible anxiety about preparing against an invader. And we don't even know who that is in the opening scene of the play. Well, everybody but in England, we know it's going to be the Spanish. They, we, they, they think they the just, Spanish is coming exactly, with an Exactly. They just lived through the most horrendous invasion threat where people were panicked. And there was a uh, uh, real panic in London as mm -hmm. people kept yelling, the Spanish are coming, the Spanish are coming, fires burning all night, chains across the street. So that had to be more than a twinge of recognition. But the Spanish weren't coming. Why did the people think that the Spanish were coming? You know, they were, like many people today, quite cynical about what they were told by the political leaders. They said, in 1588, it was the invincible Spanish armada. Didn't come, yes. This is the invisible armada, yeah. and there has to be some political stuff going on, and we don't believe what we're being told. So it also tells you, in a, in a play as politically complex as Hamlet, mm -hmm. that it's written for a deeply skeptical audience. Mm -hmm. And that skepticism is in part because they've been watching Shakespeare's plays for, for uh, you know, 15 years or 12 years, and he's trained them to so be the skeptical. So you mean the intelligentsia? I mean like everyone. I, I, don't, no. I don't go with this, you know, there are smart people in the room and there are illiterates. The average illiterate in the audience in 1599 knows a hell of a lot more than I will ever know about Shakespearean drama because they went to the theater more than New Yorkers who pride themselves on going to the theater go to mm -hmm. the theater. Mm -hmm. So we have Hamlet becoming the unease of Hamlet, a sense of dislocation not only in the world but in oneself. Right. Is the missing element here, though, that we don't know what's happening in Shakespeare's personal life? Surely something must be going on in his domestic life, his love life, or something that is leading him to write this character who is mm -hmm. looking so closely and intently at himself. There are two ways of answering that. One is obviously every writer writes out of his or her personal experience. The other is Hamlet is Shakespeare's least original play. That plot is there. <laughs> yes. It's like doing the producers over again after <laughs> right. Zero Mostel did it. I mean, the plot is there. Yeah. The characters are there. For, you know, since Saxo Grammaticus wrote that story, it hasn't changed. <laughs> right. And you it had been recently done. It had, his company when he wrote it. had yeah. been doing this play since Shakespeare arrived uh -huh. in London. Mm -hmm. And he's probably a spear chuck or a messenger saying, hey, if I put some soliloquies in here, jiggled with the politics a little bit, played up the mother stuff, whatever he was doing. Mm -hmm. So the bear, it's like the theater. They move the structure, and it's a spanking new globe theater. Right. You take this old Hamlet, and then you create something new out of it. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to tell me his son Hamlet died a couple of years earlier, so he writes Hamlet, I'll say maybe yes, maybe no, we don't, we just know. don't know. But that play existed in his imagination and in the company repertory long before Hamlet. Where did the name Hamnet come? I mean, that was his son. It's a, it's his a son's name was Hamnet. It was just, yes. it was just a popular exactly. name and similar. A, yeah. a guy named Hamnet Sadler who lived in Stratford was the godfather uh -huh. and they named the kid Hamnet. Okay. And the kid died. <laughs> but Shakespeare might have seen his son five times, mm -hmm. let's face it, since he left home yes, in he wasn't around. He was not a stay-at-home dad, was he? Like a lot yeah. of artists, I think the work came first. Yes. Um, one of the other interesting things about this book is that you are, you argue in this book that, you know, Shakespeare if he doesn't have a great library, which sadly, if he did, it's been lost, but that there were bookstores all over, and that this is he's a great reader, and that these plays are influenced by everything that he's reading. And you try to sort of pinpoint what he's reading at the time, especially if it's interesting um, um, 
a Montaigne's essay, because right. the, this is the first time we have someone in Montaigne who is just sort of closed off in his, in his little castle writing about myself. What does he say? These essays are a way of discovering exactly. myself. Exactly. Great bits of self-exploration. Mm -hmm. And there are five translators trying to translate Montaigne into English at just this moment. Mm -hmm. Florio wouldn't come out with his own edition until 1603, but everybody's doing it. There was this great moment where people got interested in the essay and then forgot about it. Mm -hmm. And this is that moment. But Shakespeare's sol the soliloquies in Hamlet are essays, though, in a way. Exactly. Exactly. And, they, you know, he, he sees the potential of the form. Mm -hmm. And he you know, he, he, he took everything he could. He's reading Plutarch's lives. He's figuring out what biography is. Mm -hmm. uh, he's figuring out even with As You Like It, which we're skipping over, how to do a kind of musical. Right. A musical right. comedy, 100 years before anybody really figured out what that was. Mm -hmm. So it's a great moment of uh, uh, intellectual growth for Shakespeare in directions that are so complicated that uh, they have to matter more, I think, than the personal element of his life, but however that weighed into it. I, you know, I, I actually, uh, when I finished this book, realized this guy had no time for personal life. <laughs> think of it for a moment. You know, it's not, it's not like Shakespeare in Love, which I love. Yeah. He rehearses a different play every morning because right. it wasn't Cats Now and Forever. Uh -huh. He stops for lunch. They perform that play in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And when the actors go off to do what actors have always done, which is carouse and get drunk until the next morning, <laughs> he has to read and write late into the night. And there's no coffee or tea in England. There's no caffeine. <laughs> how he did that or how he had time for sex, you know, gay, straight, bi, I have no idea. At the same time, though, I mean, he's a businessman. I mean, he's running this theater. We get the sense he's very prosperous. He may have been, you know, the first... You know, he was Neil Simon before Neil Simon, the most yes. successful financially playwright of his of, of his time. And without knocking Neil Simon, the difference <laughs> is, and I love Neil Simon, yeah. Shakespeare changed what he was doing every play. All right. He could have stuck with the formula for success, and the restlessness is, I think, the mark of his genius. Right. Um, and entering the realm of speculation here, but since you've spent your um, uh, professional life thinking about Shakespeare, do you have any sense what he would have been like as a person. If, he were, if we were to interview him on Theater Talk, what kind of person would we be talking about? I think he'd be a terrible guest. But I think <laughs> in the green room, he'd pick up somebody's book or rifle their book bag and say, Or he'd be this watching this interview really here. Really <laughs> interesting. Let me, I can do something with that. He was not a man uh, that I'd leave my books lying around comfortably <laughs> with. I, they're going to disappear. Uh, and he was a terrific listener. Most mm -hmm. of us are good talkers. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Shakespeare was a great writer, and you know he had his finger on the pulse of his world because he was a great listener and a terrific observer. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think he'd be anxious to get back to what he was writing. So you were thinking that he's he's he wasn't a person who would reveal himself, just as in the plays. He there's so many things going on in all those plays, but we never really can tell what is going on in the mind yeah. of a man who is writing. Them. One of the great anecdotes about him that came out shortly after he was gone was when people would come and say, "Shakespeare, go out with us." He'd say, I'm not feeling well, go without me. I'm paraphrasing it. And that, to me, captured who he was. He'd rather write. He'd rather read. So, and in other words, he would have declined the invitation to appear on Theater Talk. Uh, possibly. <laughs> his, his agent would have insisted that he would have gone, I suppose. But uh, he would have been back out the door, back reading and writing immediately. Yeah. You know, we'd profit by that. I don't think he would have been a lot of fun to hang out with, but he would have been great to... Uh, 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 be an act it would have been great to have been an actor in this company. Uh, yeah. I can't imagine what that would have been like. Just to slip over now from 1599 to 1600, uh, having writ written Hamlet, what is Shakespeare going to do next? He's going to catch his breath. We like to think of Shakespeare writing two plays a year. Yeah. This was a tremendous burst. You can imagine the relief of his fellow players saying, you've put the globe on a good footing. Right. Between the staging of Hamlet and the death of Queen Elizabeth, all there would be would be Twelfth Night and uh, Troilus and Cressida. It's a fallow period, and it's understandable. Mm -hmm. But a couple of years later, boom, you know, Othello, measure for measure, and then another great height, Lear, Macbeth, Anthony, and Cleopatra. He wrote in inspired bunches, and I was lucky enough to uh, find an exciting year to write about. Is there another year that you have in mind for a sequel to this book? Uh, if I live so long. <laughs> the next Which book would it is, be? The next book is on the authorship controversy, just so people understand oh. that Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare. Now, you believe, you believe quickly that uh, Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare, that it wasn't a group effort, it wasn't Francis Bacon. I do, it wasn't... but I'm interested in the American fascination with conspiracy theory. Mm. Whether it's the assassination of, of Kennedy or, you know, Shakespeare couldn't have written Shakespeare. It even 
even has a lot to do with the uh, the uh, argument about intelligent design. You know, a Glover's son from Stratford couldn't have created something as wonderful as and this. And yet, if you, as I think you've done uh, in essays, maybe I've read or maybe we talked about it in, in um, school. I mean.